one before we begin, I gotta chill for a bit. First of all, I have a new Twitter, again. New account is at Lone Grips. The last one got falsely reported by Sonic fans. Uh, I am now the- I also have Instagram, uh, that one too. And I have El Patreon, you can give me money. If I get a thousand dollars, I'll post feed pics or something. Anyways, that's all, bye! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I love video games. Stop the cap. <laughs> Even as a kid, I've unfortunately loved video games. Naturally, as a Goo Goo Gaga baby, a force under the pressures of an overly religious home, there weren't a whole lot of games that I could really grow up on. I couldn't even play T for Teen games until I was uh, literally 13. And being, you know, a kid who's like nine years old playing video games, the first genre I ever got into was the racing genre with the hit video game Cars the Video Game, loaned down to me for my cousin's original Xbox. Give me that game. No, sir. And of course, being a Y2K kid, I was ripe for the Wii era. And as a result, I got into the platforming genre. My three biggest gaming hyperfixations were Mario, Sonic, and Mega Man. Mega Man drops January 7th. Listen. Weezy out of here. Or as I call it, the Holy Autism Trilogy. The seed of the prophet. Yeah, no, uh, this guy loves Civ <laughs> Yeah, this guy is definitely a, like a Civ 6 player, uh, no fucking doubt. Now, all three of these franchises are part of a kind of micro-genre called Mascot Platformer. They're platformers with uh, a mascot. However, as I grew older, my taste began to change. I began to realize just how kind of unambitious a lot of these are. And by that, I mean there's no good story like The Last of Us. Of course, I'm kidding, but there really was no platformer that really scratched my itch narratively. And platformers that have narratives seem to be more bark than bite, which is a very nice way of saying, uh, they're dog shit. With rarely any actual pathos, get this game off my screen, you're ruining my argument. In other words, I wanted something a bit deeper. A mascot platformer that does whatever Hideo Kojima does. Sam, be careful. I have autism. That's when I came across this fucking guy. Planoa is a 90s platformer created by Namco, now known as Bandai Namco. You might know them as the Pac-Man guys or the Dark Souls guys. The first game, Klonoa Door to Phantom Mile, released in 1997. It's a PS1 exclusive 2.5D platformer. It eventually got a sequel four years later on the PS2, Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil. And seven years later, it got a Wii remake, we'll talk about that. And a whole 12 years later, it got a remastered package called the Fantasy Reverie series. Now, you may be wondering, what's so special about Klonoa? This looks like any other 2.5D platformer ever made. What's so special about this lip- Depression. Klonoa is in actuality a deconstruction of its own genre and media, and I feel is actually incredibly ahead of its time. We're gonna be analyzing all the mainline games, sorry Klonoa Beach Volleyball, obviously spoilers ahead, blah blah blah. Let's just jump right into it. I don't wanna meet people, I don't really wanna party, party. I just wanna commit to one shot. sorry. Seems that this wish is never granted. Granted, I can barely keep my body standing, damn it. you hate that title screen? That's adorable. So before our game even begins, it's giving us the storybook typewriter aesthetic. This is important, by the way. So our game begins with this weirdly ethereal quote. It's strange. Sometimes I can't remember my dreams, though I'm sure I saw them. Where do these dreams go? But I remember this one dream, as clearly as if it were reflected in a mirror. All set to the backdrop of a moon and this weird ring. All over this surprisingly <laughs> sad song. And this is an incredibly weird way of starting a mascot platformer. A lot of games are just more than happy to thrust you into the action as a way to compensate for not really having a good story. How many chasers are left? Tell me! You didn't say please! Hey guys, welcome to my Freedom Planet audition. Uh, this- Manoa, on the other hand, is subdued, yet mysterious. It sets a tone right. It's uh, kinda nice, actually. But now it's time for a real game to begin. So first off, we meet Klonoa. He's just a little guy playing in the woods. But then something drops behind us. And it turns out it's that ring thing from the intro. So naturally, we pull it out of the goddamn ground. And now pops this weird little blue guy. We end up running around the field all happy with. This is Hupo, our best friend in the game. And who will be spending 
spending most of our time with. I gotta say, by the way, this cutscene is absolutely beautiful. The game has a number of animated FMV cutscenes, and they're all so beautiful. Also colorful and expressive. But oh shit, a crash happens. And the sky goes all gray, and shit be getting kinda scary. But then turns out it's just a dream. And our friend Hupo is right there next to us. So the dream is both a flashback and not a flashback. A little cliched, but hey, it sets up what you need to know. But then turns out an actual crash happens. And Quinoa points out this weird coincidence. <laughs> And just like that, we spring into action. And just like that, we're in our first level. So far, I'm getting those Donkey Kong Country type vibes. Anyways, we're under attack by these really adorable, non-threatening enemies. So the big gimmick of this game is that it's a 2.5D platformer with inflation mechanics. Inflate enemies to throw them at each other, jump off of enemies, create weird apports. You can even throw them in the background too. That's cool. A pretty simple but carried by really good level design. On top of beautiful PS1 vistas. It's a beautiful looking game. From the low sprites of the scenery, this game oozes so much charm. Plus the music also be completely bopping. So we enter into this area and encounter this guy, apparently. This is Baloo, who's building a giant statue for Lafitte. A diva he seems to really admire. And by admire, I mean wants to fuck. Okay, that's, uh, cool, man. Keep telling that to this nine-year-old. I'm sure he'll understand. So we move through this really beautiful-looking PS1 cave. Before we reach the top of Bell Hill and meet our villain of the game. This tall, imposing, a fashion demon named Gaddius. And his sidekick, the, the fucking... Joker. He's intimidating and weird as a villain, and is so out of place in an otherwise cute and cuddly game, with this long black robe and weirdly realistic bottom half of a human face. This makes sense because he is revealed to be the king of nightmares later on, so he does look like a weird, out of place nightmare. He's almost a third as scary as Skibbity Toilet. That's a topical humor. So the two have knocked out Lafice and are looking for her pendant. If you remember, Lafice is the girl this guy wants to fuck, but turns out they can't find the pendant, but not before noticing us. So Gaddius runs off with Lafice, and now we're stuck fighting the Joker. You'll encounter Joker multiple times throughout the game, but a good majority of it is kind of just a big old cat and mouse chase, where he does some evil henchman shenanigans. And man, he's a fucking little giggly ass annoying dickhead. So let's kick his fucking ass real quick. And now it's time for our first boss of the game, with his goofy ass name, Rongo Longo. goofy a oingo boingo ass name. But overall, it's a simple boss, pick up enemies, hit his behind weak spots. I was spanked 11 times by Playboy Cardi. I love the boss health meter though, it's a physical rectangle that goes down. It's cool uwu PS1 core shit. And of course, naturally, we kick his ass. And further, naturally, Joka runs away like a little bitch. But hey, on the ground, there's that pendant they were looking for. So we give it to a character named Grandpa. And it apparently belongs to a mystical moon kingdom. So we're told to go to Forlock Forest and find Granny. So a lot of this stuff so far has been pretty typical. To the point where you could mistake it for being derivative. You got a main character who is literally a mascot. In the exact same vein as Sonic, Gex, Bubsy, fucking awesome possum. Hold on! Kanoa even has a little Pac-Man hat. Why does he have it? I don't know. Because it's adorable, that's why. And for around a half the game, this is kind of how the game is. What Klonoa here is doing is starting you off on something kind of familiar. It's simply giving you stuff you already know, just with a bit more finesse to it. In other words, it's letting your guard down. Anyways, we're headed to Forlock, deep in the dying forest. This is where we encounter a few Forlork tribesmen, and where we unlock doors. This goes on until we encounter this soldier guy, who comes from a place called Jugpot, the Water Kingdom. And sadly, he tells Tells us the path ahead is broken, we can't go further. But then it accidentally spills that his king needs to be saved or something. So let's go to Jugpot to save him. It turns out though the waterfall is falling backwards, this damn economy. So now we know why the path is stuck, so let's get it unstuck. By the way, I love how this level goes from dusty mountain area to a beautiful ancient looking water park. Lots of cool visuals here, I love it. We then meet La Fish, who is trapped in the cage, who has a very high pitched voice. <laughs> So because of fuck 12, we free the fish. Where he exclaims that his name is Carol and his mom needs saving. But by the way, uh, yes, this is a dude. Anyways, he helps us get into the castle. Where Carol's mom, Pamela, and the king of the kingdom are both cursed and evil now. So what better way to fix these two than to kick their ass? We just inflated this fucking king and beat this kid's mom with it and beat the evil spell out of him. Honestly, the fucking base. So now we fix the way forward and now it's time to visit Granny. So we free some guards to push forward. And sadly, you find out that Gaddius's army has taken over Granny. House. But of course, that ain't gonna stop us. We're locked and loaded. You know how a man love his dog? 
I love my gun. By the way, I love this part where this little 3D platform zooms around this whole 3D environment of the level. It's just real cool shit, you know? Anyway, some platforming and puzzle solving later, we find Granny tied up. And now it's time for our next boss, the Gelg Bolm, the Glup Shitto. This time, you gotta drop enemies into his mouth, put some balls in his jaws. And as always, we put a cap on that motherfucker. Fuck yeah, gang shit. So we save Granny, where she reveals that Gadius is a dark spirit that returns, and something about there being a dream that creates this world. Well, whatever she's babbling about, about, we need one thing, and that's the moon pendant from earlier. And we gotta take that bitch to the Temple of the Sun, so we can go to this other place called the Moon Kingdom and save the day. But of course, Grandpa has the moon pendant, so we gotta go back to him and grab that. But it turns out, Joko was spying on us, so we gotta get that moon pendant before he does. So we travel through the ruins of the Wind Kingdom, a by far the most bleak level in this game. So many broken and muted grays and greens here. You're in a desolate area you're not supposed to really be in. It's a nice way of estimating the game as it goes on. Anyway, so we make it over to Grandpa. Now we can grab that moon pendant. Except, uh, something changes here. Uh, and this right here is where Klonoa becomes Klonoa, in my opinion. Look, killing off characters isn't a new thing, especially in children's fiction. But this scene is so tonally just out of place in a game like this. The way they kill off the grandpa is just so morbid. This scene lasts for an uncomfortably long amount of time. Obviously, it's shortened for the video, but for almost a minute and a half, you get this droning noise. And then, without any villain monologue preluding it or anything, they hit you with a fucking drone strike in front of a goddamn nine-year-old. And all you see on Klonoa's face is this. You can tell he doesn't even know how to respond to this or to process any of this. Calling this heart-wrenching would be an understatement. And the only thing we can do now is get our revenge on Joka and fight him. Who now has that moon pendant. Who is proud of the fact that he just committed a war crime, you know, base. Which leads into my favorite boss of the game. This giant moth creature with glass windows on its body have to shatter. It's already a really fun boss, but the context of your grandpa being dead just adds so much momentum to this boss. Also, are those bloody marks on its body? Jesus Christ. But after killing him, we go look for grandpa, who at this point is barely alive. And his last words are just so bleak in this game, We're talking about how fate has run its course. Again, it's shockingly out of nowhere, but a very provocative and well-paced smart way. Hearing this nine-year-old kid whimper over his grandpa is just so sad. And the fact that grandpa barely has any character development actually adds on to it. The grandpa says in this game, it was a short while, but it was wonderful. The game is basically saying the people you love the most will die one day and out of nowhere. And you don't really think about it or realize it until you get there. In fact, in this game, that's what you've been doing the whole time, haven't you? Playing this cute game for a quick hit of quick escapism, but inevitably the real world will reel its head towards you. So enjoy the time you have now because it won't always last forever. And this entire scene doesn't hit in spite of it being out of place and it hits because of it. And this game is simply reflecting a very real concept. Something you don't often see in these types of games. But reminder, this is just the midway point. We have to get that moon pendant back now. Even though you kind of really don't want to. Hearing Klonoa's voice after his grandpa dies just makes you want to turn off the game. Give the poor kid a fucking rest. <laughs> Weird comparison, but this game gives me Spec Ops The Line flashback. Where, yeah, it has, a uh, war crimes. And does everything narratively in its power to get you to stop playing the damn thing. War crimes are cool, are cool. But still, we have to push on. But thankfully, the fish mom from earlier is here. And, uh, she flies now. Hi, everyone. Welcome to my channel. Uh, it's my funny skit. This is If Disney Wrote Chlamydia. Um, guys, he's gonna feel that one in the morning. Uh, I think that one's gonna leave a mark. Thanks for watching.
And she's here to help transport us to the Temple of the Sun. And once we arrive and enter inside, we meet two priests and four pedestals. And long story short, we gotta put some balls on them. So we go through that level collecting balls and shit. And long story short, our path finally opens. We then leave these pussies behind and meet the High Priest. Where he reveals that we're too late and the evil gate has opened. And Gaddius plans to quote-unquote replace dreams with nightmares. That dream, of course, being the land of Phantom Isle. However, we do still have a chance to stop him. However, this means the next level will face between light and dark. The whole gimmick is basically in the dark, enemies are invincible, but certain platforms show up. It's a tough nearing endgame level, and honestly, it's a bit frustrating. But thankfully, I'm the master at video games, so I beat the level no problem. All thanks to being called slurs in Counter-Strike 2. Oh my god, it's actually really hard to shoot and talk. Wow. Yeah, so maybe shut the fuck up. Shut up, you're literally a fucking no, like, uh, anime bridge. Like, actually. And you're white. I can't imagine what's worse. Imagine being black. It's gotta suck. No comment. We then get this hard to fucking shot right here. And we encounter Gaddius, mad at Joka for keeping us alive. Gaddius then reveals his motivations, which is to get his revenge on everyone for trapping him in Nightmare. Overall, pretty typical bad guy motivation stuff. But Gaddius escapes, and now we're left with Joka. So now it's time to kick his ass for Grandpa. And basically, this boss fight is stepping on tiles and avoiding attacks. Nothing complicated, but visually really cool. We then kill Joka. But as he dies, he says we'll end up in a world of nothingness. And gee, thanks, Klonoa, for reminding me of my crippling fear of death. However, we're too late, the moon portal opens and the moon kingdom comes out of the ground. And now Klonoa is fucking pissed. But thankfully, Pamela is here to give us a helping hand again. So now we're at the next level, the moon kingdom. But Hubo starts acting a little weird, like he's hiding something. But our focus is very quickly directed back to Gaddius. Okay, well, let's go through the moon kingdom then. Complete with this impressive fucking glitter floor. God damn. Anyways, we climb these stairs and beat the level. But when we get there, something happens. We're first greeted by a mysterious voice saying, Sir Hupo. The voice is coming from this guard who also calls him Sire. And to make things weirder, we meet this woman who Hupo refers to as Mother. And of course, this woman is the Queen of the Moon Kingdom. This makes Klonoa, you know, a little confused. So basically, here's what happens. <laughs> So it turns out Hupo is the prince of the moon kingdom the whole time. Kind of a weird thing to keep ah. secret. But Klonoa got his shit held down. He ain't tripping about this. And because Hupo's his friend, he still trusts him in the end. It's so sweet that even in the worst of it, Klonoa still has his best friend right by him. And we're gonna need that because we're in the hardest level now. The final level of this game is so goddamn hard. Especially when you're on these tiny pea-sized platforms that crumble underneath you. It's to the point where it is kind of unbalanced. You better hope to God you have like 21 lives in this area. Otherwise, you have to play through the whole world again. Not to mention, this level alone is like a 15-20 minutes. And thankfully, though, I'm perfect at video games, and I beat the level flawlessly. So now it's time to beat this damn game. First off, I love how this next cutscene begins with this shot here of just the floor, which then transitions into the throne room as we enter. Although Gaddius gives his cryptic evil villain monologue. Like, why is this so well constructed? They didn't have to go this hard. Why does it go hard? So anyways, Gaddius is tired of this world neglecting nightmares, relying only on good dreams. And whether he he dies with it or not doesn't matter since he's already been abandoned by the world. While Gaddius isn't the most complicated villain ever, I do like how this monologue does humanize him a little bit. Just going a little beyond the generics, you know? But of course, since he's destroying the world, it's time for us to stop this motherfucker. So we have this real trippy boss fight where of course we throw enemies at him. In TLDR, we end up defeating him. All of our friends then show up, but Gaddius isn't done yet and is still alive. And he unleashes this nightmare entity called Nahatone. So now with the help of the true power of friendship, we gotta take him out. Except before we can do anything... <laughs> Hupo has been hiding something about us. Which, you know, after our grandpa's death, you know, no pressure. But now, why is that? What the hell is exactly going on here? Well, whatever it is, we don't really have time to talk about it right now. So we leave the crumbling moon tower and meet our friends. We're armed with giant cannons that we had to fire at the same time. We also encounter the giant big Nahatome boss. And thus, we're at the final part of the game. So this boss has three phases. Right now, of course, we're at phase one. And our job is to reload cannons with enemies while dodging attacks. And after that's over, the bad guy vores us inside for whoa, phase two. Whoa. Oh 
gun. He vored a nine-year-old too. Ew. Anyways, we gotta hit crystals and dodge this guy's face. And after all that, we're spat out into phase three. This time we gotta load the cannons again, but it's a bit harder this time around. Our friends are all taking cover underneath the platform. So we gotta time our ammo refills just right. However, after all this, Hupo tells us we need to shoot him with our wind bullet. This, however, might end up killing Hupo. So Noah's reluctant at first, but Hupo convinces us that we have to win. And that we'll always be together. Well, not too many options left. Let's take him out then. <laughs> So we did it. We saved Lafice. And in turn, Phantom Mile, as all the nightmares disappear. And of course, everyone begins to celebrate. Everyone except Klonoa. And thankfully, though, our old pal is still alive. So Klonoa reaches out his hand and grabs him just in time. And we get this close-up shot before cutting back to Phantom Mile. Well, Klonoa and Hupo are finally together. As you can tell, the world's gonna need a bit of fixing. But through everything, through all the nightmare, through every real death, the one thing that persevered was true bond, true friendship. We made a lot of friends along the way, but it was the closest ones that helped us in the end. They're the ones who helped us persevere, helped us overcome the... What? So turns out, uh, everything was a lie. Klonoa isn't actually from Phantom Isle at all. All of his memories were actually completely fake memories implanted by Hupo. And every single character you've met over the game, you didn't actually know. They were all just strangers. It's unclear if they had false memories or if they were all in on it. But the two characters we do know that knew this were Hupo and Gadius. This includes Grandpa, who turns out wasn't really your grandpa at all. Neither of you actually knew each other. And it gets worse. Phantom Mile was never even meant to be your home. Klonoa is an entity that doesn't belong in Phantom Mile. He's only there to save the world and that's it. And once the diva you saved sings the song of rebirth, it's all over. Klonoa's gonna have to leave Phantom Mile. And of course, because of all this, Klonoa starts freaking out. Nabra! 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 But there really isn't anything he can do at all. And this is where the ending is. And we get one last FMV cutscene that will always emotionally destroy me. I'm not gonna play the full thing out for you, but trust me, I wish I could. And I at least implore you to watch it through after the segment ends. So a portal opens, transporting Klonoa back to wherever he's from. And Hupo tells him it's time to go back home. Back to his Phantom Isle. Klonoa begs all he can to stay. He doesn't want to leave. And Hupo, seemingly not wanting this either, tries to save him at the last minute. He grabs on for dear life, and you can hear the struggles in their voices. It's Jesus Christ. But Hupo can't do anything either. Klonoa is sent back home. And Hupo, like Klonoa, is left all alone. However, as the song in the background ends and the world heals, Hupo wipes his tears, looks around, and smiles, knowing that in spite of everything, the world is saved and healed. We then transition to a storybook, where we get our credit sequence and one last shot. The front cover of Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle, with our name as the author. And thus ends Klonoa door to Phantom Isle. Now, I know what you guys are thinking right now. What the hell is even that? Welp, that's the Klonoa experience. An absolutely devastating twist ending. But also one of my favorites in any game ever. You see, what Klonoa did is question its own existence as narrative fiction. And it is, in the end, about our relationship with storytelling. Klonoa is almost metafictional in this regard. And that's not just the game, that's the character. Klonoa is meant to represent us, the player. But more specifically, a younger player, but you can still relate to to him when you're an adult. Klonoa is meant to be the player insert. And oftentimes, a lot of people tend to escape to fiction to escape their own problems. So what Klonoa does is give this little kid a really bad hand. It's telling you, okay, you saved the world, but this is just a story, a dream. And while there's nothing wrong with storytelling or dreaming, the issue is that you don't belong in dream worlds. You belong in yours. It's similar to how in actual dreams you have false memories and meet people you don't actually know, going on adventures you won't actually have. The dreams you embark 
embark on in stories are much the same. And no matter how much you beg to stay, you're going to have to go back eventually. You can't escape bad things from happening to you. Even in dreams, pain will exist. That's why your name is on the book. It's good to dream, but there will always be a dreamer beyond that, a writer beyond the book. You're gonna have to return to your own Phantom Isle, whether you want to or not. However, as sad as the world is, and even though he was kind of lied into it, Fanoa still met tons of people. Even though they weren't real, he saved the world and made their lives better. So who's to say you maybe can't learn a little bit from that? Dreams, art, fiction, these are all ways that we can emotionally interpret the world. So allow it to be an outlet, but not an escape for your problems. And that's what I adore about this game. It's deeply sad and personal, but it's not like nihilistic. All this leads to me, a man in his 20s, tearing up by the final FMV cutscene of this game. And the game leaves me with one question. Uh, how the hell are they gonna follow that up? <laughs> No, but like, for real, what the fuck are they gonna do here? So, I'm gonna be honest, up until the final level, it took me a while to truly get Klonoa 2. Like, the first game was such a shockingly smart and bold tearjerker, but the second game doesn't quite carry on a lot of that, especially not at the beginning. Like, Klonoa 1 never happened at all, which made me ask, uh, what's the point? Hell, the game even just looks different, with the art style shifting to more of a Sonic-like direction. Ew. Instead of those big old beady eyes and that short little stature, Klonoa is now lankier, he's snowboarding, He's posing cool. He's looking mad. His iconic Pac-Man hat? Guess what? It's backwards now, fuckers. And most importantly, his eyes! No, bring them back, please! But after playing the whole game, I can safely say that I have grown to appreciate it. And it really is a phenomenal sequel and a good-ass game that properly does continue with the first game set up. It takes a bit to get there, but like the first game, when you get there, you really see it. <sighs> That's that real music, man. Come back home. So we open just like our first game, with that ring and some text on the front. No doubt a foreshadowing our plot. There's a forgotten dream. Was it a dream I can't remember, or a dream I won't remember? Have I forgotten the dream, or has the dream forgotten me? But surely, there was a dream. We open on Klonoa in a black void, sinking into nothingness before something calls out to us. <laughs> Rise and shine. Klonoa then wakes up before being dropped into a strange ocean. I am under the water. Please help me. We then see a plane in the silhouettes of two people who seem to know who we are and want something with us. Which, by the way, implies that everyone in Phantom Isle also knew who we are. So basically, Grandpa's a liar and deserved to get drone strikes. Klonoa Theory, in real life, he's a real boy and in a coma. Is the rapper Summers gay now? It's a lot I'm gay. Top 10 Klonoa Theories that will shock you. Number 8, we have Dirt 5. So anyways, we wash up on the beach and meet these two people. These people are Lolo and Popka. Lolo is a priest in training, and Popka is a dog thing, and whoever they are, they seem to be on our side. They also tell us we're the dream traveler, basically meaning that Klonoa's whole existence is basically go to different worlds and save them. In other words, it's the plot twist of the first game, but now it's built on to be the cornerstone of the franchise, which is actually kinda cool. You can introduce so many new dreams and worlds without things getting convoluted, and the fact you don't fully find this out until the second game is also really cool, implying that more games can build off of each other while also being their own entity. This sounds like a great formula. I'm sure nothing will fuck it up in the end. So Lolo enters into our ring, so I guess she's our new Hupo now. Transitioning us to our first level, the Sea of Tears. One of the most un-first level areas I've ever seen. It's a stormy, deserted island, reflecting the aftermath of how you would feel after Klonoa 1. Fucking depressed. But it's also not overly gloomy either. It gets you set up for the adventure ahead. Also, this game graphically is just beautiful. The jump to 3D graphics was not at the sacrifice of the art style. There's a nice cell shaded look to this game, which allows all the characters to really pop out from the rest of the scenery. And the environments feel much more atmospheric and dense. While I do think the first game is overall better visually, I love what the second game still attempts to do, which is to translate that dreamlike feeling of the first game into a 3D environment. The only thing I don't like artistically in this game is Klonoa's new design. Like, do they have to make him look at this much like a Sonic character. I know he's older now, but where are those big ol' fucking yellow eyes? I miss those. It's not the worst redesign ever or anything. It's just uh, not my thing. Honestly, it's just probably my Sonic hate boner. Who knows? Hey everyone, we're gonna be counting down the top 10 Sonic games. Uh, here we go. Okay guys, thank you for watching. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe.
Anyway, so we get this nice little dragon thingy set piece. I'm not sure what this actually is supposed to be, but you know what? It looks cool. Who gives a shit? So after some more level, we make it to this statue, which is housing this bell here. So we're instructed to ring it, so we do. And Lolo is really happy that we rung it. But there's a reason for this, because only people with enough spiritual power can make it ring. So now Lolo can become a full-on priestess. Just uh, one red flag, though. <laughs> She's kind of fucking stupid. But anyways, we're off to a guy named Baguji, the best prophet in all of Lunatea. <laughs> Which means we at least know where we are now, which is the land of Lunatea. Oh! So we head down and meet Baguji. We both knew and foretold we were coming. And he explains that the world of Lunatea is made up of four kingdoms, each one housing a different bell. And these bells are called Harmony Bells and maintain peace in Lunatea, meaning this place is pure utopia for yeet type beat producers. I don't clean my fucking booty. It's so good, bro. There's also a fifth bell, a bell of darkness. A bell causing chaos and monsters to appear. Well, on the bright side, Lolo, who we just met, can become a priestess now. Okay. Well, she did save us earlier and we had nothing better to do, so let's help her out. So we travel down to La Lakusha, which is what I smoked this morning, by the way. Watch Mojo Game Theory is Klonoa about smoking weed? Anyways, we stop by the statue here. A statue a lot like the one we passed earlier in the game. But both of them, however, are different statues of a goddess named Claire. The old one is of Claire the Ancient. And is, according to Popka, quote unquote, all that remained after she was purged of all evil. This one, though, is of the mother goddess Claire. I'm gonna assume that this goddess Claire is kind of the Jesus Christ of this universe. Uh, judging that after a bit more level, we finally meet the high priestess. And immediately, right behind her is Claire again. Oh my god, a disco Elysium reference? Anyway, so here we are with the high priestess, who anoints Lolo with the rank and responsibilities of a priestess. Basically, a priestess is someone who keeps peace in Lunatea. And our first order of business is to travel to the four kingdoms and ring all four harmony bells to prevent the evil from happening. What the evil is, we don't quite know yet, and we're not gonna sit here and find out. But our first bell, the Bell of Tranquility, is nearby. So we're about to head out, but the priestess calls for Klonoa's name, and she tells us to watch over and protect Lolo. And this right here is where the level ends. So, to the bell we go, right? Except, oh shit, it's that ship from earlier. So we're finally introduced to Learina and Tat, the two pirates that were in the ship in the beginning. And Learina wants our world-famous Klonoa ring, which of course leads into our first boss. A boss that's pretty much just throw enemies at its weak spots. But fairly straightforward, so we beat it pretty easily. And the bad guys gloat and escape because they're fucking pussies. So we can finally ring that bell of tranquility. Well, we get this green MacGuffin, which is an element, I guess. So Noah then gets another vision of a voice asking him to help him. So a lot of strange things are happening now. But enough of that, we got more bells to ring. So we head down to the kingdom of Joyland, a giant amusement park kingdom, which is the kingdom of joy, hence the name Joyland. Because our side characters are kind of stupid, the character of Tad steals our element. And Tad also has the power to split into two people, so they run off into two directions. This gives us a choice of what level to play next, and honestly, uh, it's kind of pointless. The order of levels don't alter the story at all, and you have to play them both anyway, so really, what was the point of this? We do get a waterboard now, though. Uh, extreme! So we get our elements back and go and ring the bell of Joyland. But again, we got another monster to fight. So of course, we beat that boss, you know, pretty easy. And the bad guys run away again, and we ring the next bell. Finally getting our next MacGuffin. Next up is the kingdom of Volk. And the next area plays out very similarly. This time, we're going to Volk to ring the bell of Discord. And Volk is an angry place where people are always fighting. There's a lot of rubble, a lot of city area, a lot of industrial areas, and the more you progress through it, the more red and harsher it gets. The thing is, though, we don't do a lot different here than anywhere else, which I will admit is kind of a problem. The first around a half of Klonoa 2 is very repetitive, to the point where it can be seen as aimless and generic. You go to this kingdom, encounter the pirates, play some levels, fight a boss or two. The story is a MacGuffin chase for a pretty big majority of it. And not to say that's automatically bad, but it's kind of all that happens, really. Again, the first game didn't really have to do that. However, there are some things to establish here. For one thing, there are three bells so far, right? We had Tranquility and Lalakusha, Joy and Joyland, and Discord and Volk. So pretty obviously, each kingdom is meant to be an emotional state. This isn't really subtle either as one of the characters points this out. But anyways, what does happen here is Learina creates her own ring. She then rings the bell herself and takes that bell's element for herself. She then leaves with the element and blows shit up, so we have to escape without that element. And thankfully though, we do escape, and we're on our way to Mira Mira, where the Bell of Indecision lies. However, to do so, we gotta get on the Ark and go through the Lake of Seclusion. Hmm, indifference? Seclusion? I wonder if there's a connection here. Which also establishes that at one point, the kingdoms were all in a harmony. But for some reason, they're all isolated now. However, as we leave, Baba G looks at Klonoa and goes, your future is veiled to me. Foreshadowing. Anyways, we go through this level and go to these mountainous areas. Where Popka pulls out a snowboard and we get a snowboarding level. All set to the backdrop of the best song ever made. <laughs> For 
the record, I have no clue why Klonova is singing here. I don't know what narrative significance it has, and honestly, that kind of makes it better. Anyways, we make it down to the bottom, and we find this giant museum where the bell might be. Inside, we see this really strange <laughs> architecture, and this weird creature called a Mira Miran, who explains that they never venture outside. After all, we can bask in memories right here. In other words, they're Valorant players. They then continue, just as art is a reflection of the soul, these mirrors are reflections of our past. Why leave if you can keep reliving bygone days? Well, we finally got something to analyze, but first I'm gonna make it through the level. Which, on that note, this is one of my favorite levels in the game, by the way. So many unique puzzles, and visually, just wow. So many shifting rooms and so many colors. I just really love this level. It's just very good, okay? Okay? So we pass by this giant mirror here, where we flash into Lolo's psyche and her fear of not being a good enough priestess. She's then bullied and ridiculed, but grabs the Klonoa ring and shatters the mirror, showing them all. Lolo then reveals a pretty massive insecurity. The fact that it was Klonoa's power that made her a priestess and not Lolo herself. And she apologizes for doing so. But now this is interesting. We pass through the lake of seclusion, right? And the people here are secluded from the rest of the world, constantly reminding themselves of their own past. This is really interesting. In the original game, that whole point was the game will eventually end at some point. And you can't escape the harsh realities of the real world and its pain. It seems like these people are the result of the opposite of that. Constantly wallowing in their own memories and past. And Lolo's insecurity is kind of the start of becoming that. Too much self-reflection leads to you becoming disillusioned, becoming an almost husk-like being. I was watching this video by a guy named Bob the Pop-Up. He's kind of a music reaction channel, and he said something very similar in one of his videos. I hope those of you who are listening to this album right now and using it because it's it's where you are, it's kind of mixing with your feelings, it's you know, those types of things. You gotta be careful, because I feel like stuff like this is important. It's important to experience and, and process and ultimately expel these emotions that are inside of us, these feelings. But the process must involve getting it out. Out. Not drowning in it. And it's easy sometimes to almost fall in love with your own sadness. Your own sadness become, kind of becomes your own friend in a way. You cling to it but all you're doing is just wallowing in a sense. Now the context for it is the album Watch My Back by Lucky, an album that's uh, a lot darker, dealing with things like uh, drug abuse. Nothing like starting my day with some Lucky juice. I have a severe drug addiction. At least I have free wave three to keep me company. I'm going through a divorce. So I think the sentiments are overall the same here. It is absolutely important to have art help us understand the world. But just like a drug, it's easy to get addicted and to wallow in your sadness. It's also interesting that Popka, when confronted by this, initially says, what a bunch of old fogey stuff. I remember back in my day, the whole 90s kids epidemic, where everybody was all like, the 90s were so much better. Green Day, we had Green Day. What do kids these days have? And kids like me would roll our eyes and go, was it really that much better? Either that or force ourselves to agree with them to look cooler. But then we get older and start reminiscing on our past. And the older we get, the harder life gets. So it's real easy without realizing it to fall into the same existential trap everyone else does. It's not bad to be nostalgic, but remember not to wallow in it. But you can't be like the Mira Mirans and Mira Mira. Oh, mirror, mirror? This all comes full circle in the next boss fight. So the bell is in this old talking tree who starts roasting Lolo. He then summons a giant boss, but Lolo isn't fighting it. So we have to fight it without our famous Klonoa ring. Meanwhile, in the middle, Lolo feels unqualified to save the world. However, Popka gives her a pet talk and points at Klonoa. He emphasizes the fact that he's not even from this world, and yet he's still fighting to save it anyway. Not necessarily because he wants to, but because it's all he knows. And the crazy part is that even though Klonoa isn't part of Lunatea, we know what world he was pre previously from, and how much of a complete lie it was in the end. However, he's still fighting for something. At first, I was underwhelmed by Klonoa 2's lack of character development in the main character, but the fact that Klonoa moves on so fast and still fights for something is kind of the point. He knows the world of Lunatea is a dream, and yet he's still fighting for something. He's using this dream of Lunatea to expel what previously happened, and that gives him purpose as a dream traveler. And after we beat the boss, that old tree is actually impressed of our determination. And he finishes by saying a doubt is a part of us all that we can't deny. But if you can accept doubt and move forward, everything else will eventually fall into place. Damn. Bars!
So we ring the bell and make it back to Baba G. And we give him all the elements, except wait a minute, it's Leorina all the old die! And she uses all the elements to get vague revenge on people. Oh no, not the stock market! And now she's disappeared, so we gotta go to the high priestess for help. So if you're going through a harder version of Lalakusha, this game kind of reuses levels from now on. It's not very great. The high priestess reveals that Leorina was once a priestess herself named Leo. We wanted to find power by her own means. Meanwhile, though, Leorina summons the evil fifth bell. So we gotta go out and confront her, of course. So we go back through the Sea of Tears and confront her. However, she then rings all five bells at once, opening the pathway to the fifth kingdom. And now suddenly the sea from the beginning is all sandy wasteland. This time called the Empty Sea of Tears. I am filming in the California desert with YouTube's field day crew. Along the way, we keep hearing that dream voice telling us to help them. But no time for that. We're too busy dealing with Lee Arena right now, who tries killing us, but for some reason, something malfunctions. There's something called the power of sorrow is overtaking her. Her destroy lonely wolf is overtaking her. Transforming her into a giant Pokemon we have to fight. I am the opium creature. Get out of me. Ah! OMG, I think I'm turning into the Opium Creature. So we take her down and transform her back to normal. And she realizes the error of her way. First of all, though, all while saying that dreaded D word. But she also laments that her power can't overcome sorrow. And we have to stop the creature of sadness. Which is what the fifth kingdom really is. The kingdom of sorrow. Lee Arena wanted to force her sorrow onto the world. But it ended up harming her instead and only we can stop it. So long story short, we blow up the boat connecting the worlds together. And we finally arrive in the last area. The kingdom of of sorrow. And now we have to stop the mysterious king of sorrow. And this kingdom is pretty unsettling, man. You see in the background random beds and chairs. There are weird, creepy masks hanging around. And that song. What the hell is this? Wait a minute. These building structures look familiar. And so do these rocking chairs. Where do I know these from? And there's a mask right on top of that one too. Okay, that's a little too specific of placement for that thing. And what the hell is going on with the music? Weird backwards shit starts playing? The fuck? Is this silent to hell? In fact, most of the songs in this game are less than four minutes, except for this one. And this song for the Kingdom of Sadness is a whopping eight minutes. And wait a minute, listen to this real quick. Wait a minute, that's Lolo's theme. Wait, reverse that one backwards part again. Wait, that was the song in the last cutscene. And this keeps going too, there's more of this. Except they're not from this game anymore. And the name of the song is called Huponia, Ruin of Sadness. Oh! Of course, it was this little piece of shit! I'm gonna find this little blue fuck and choke him out! Doesn't even have a goddamn neck! I'll find a way! Except that's not what happens. The King of Sorrow isn't an old friend turned bad. He isn't the giant monster at the end of the book. This is the man behind the curtains. A fucking Sonic fan character. But seriously, this is him, the King of Sorrow. And if you haven't noticed, he looks a lot like Klonoa. And not this Klonoa, but the original game's design. And the twist isn't even that he's the same species as Klonoa. In fact, nobody brings that up at all. The twist, and the game expects you to purely know this by the visuals, is that the King of Sorrow is Klonoa. It's the depressed emotional state after the first game. One that Klonoa's been suppressing and fighting. The King of Sorrow looks, sounds, and speaks so lethargically. And yet, he's so lonely. He reveals that the fifth bell wasn't gone, it was always in the world. But simply put, Lunatic Taya refused to see it. Every kingdom we've played so far is a response to coping with sadness. We go from tranquility, peace, and harmony, to joy, kind of chaotic happiness, to anger, complete discord, to indifference, holding on to the past for one last string of happiness. It's like the game itself is secretly going through its own stages of grief. Not only that, but Baguji wasn't even a real person. The whole time, the King of Sorrow was in disguise. Our characters are false saviors led on by false prophecy, which is also exactly what Hupo did to Klonoa. This is what would have happened to Klonoa if Klonoa 2 never happened. If he didn't meet Lolo and Popka, if he didn't find the values in other people,
people. If he didn't stop fighting, even if he didn't have much of a reason to, Klonoa would have just become the very thing that hurt him. Klonoa, consumed by sorrow, would have just become Hupo. But we still have a boss to fight in the end. So we beat his first phase, which by the way is extremely trippy. The king then laments about how people can't accept sorrow, asking, is there no place for me in the world? But Leorina, now on our side, appears. And she says, and I quote, you isolated yourself from the world, thinking that you're the only one who's sad. And shows Klonoa to show him the powers of the other kingdoms, or other emotions. The values and the absurdity of life. And we do so by beating his final boss form. You know, uh, the hey, video game gamers. shit. And once we defeat him, the king cries for help, as he was doing throughout the entire game. And Klonoa helps him. He comes to terms with his own sadness. And Klonoa tells him that the world won't forget about sorrow anymore. And no one will run away anymore. After all, we've come too far to turn back, right? Klonoa acknowledges that he won't forget sadness. But as the king fades away and turns into an element, we, along with Klonoa, realize that even though there might be false prophecies, and while awful, terrible things will always happen to us, we have people to fight for. Popka then notes that Klonoa reminds him of the goddess Claire a little bit. That statued woman who pured herself of all evil. A woman who's adored by Lunatea. And a woman who might be an allusion to Klonoa. I think, again, this is another statement Klonoa makes on art itself. And the almost religious-like influence it can have on us as people. Klonoa obviously isn't a real person. He's a fake fictional character. But yet he's also meant to be us. A character who, in spite of the worst of everything, makes it out okay. And always finds somebody, something to fight for. Klonoa is not real. He's a fictional character. But at the same time, Klonoa is real. And Klonoa is our friend. Well, we've made it this far, haven't we? We still got one more scene, so let's finish up here. Lee Arena is rebuilding the Kingdom of Sorrow, and Lolo gave up her priestess title to earn it on her own. I feel like saving the world would be qualification enough, but you do you, pal. But in the end, everything's all right and okay. And what a journey it's been to get here. This shit means something to me, man. Both Klonoa 1 and Klonoa 2 are so brilliant. I wouldn't say Klonoa 2 is perfect on a narrative level. There's certainly parts that drag, there are contrivances, but that doesn't matter because Klonoa Klonoa 2 is perfect for Klonoa. It's the ending of his story, the ending of his sorrow and his pain. Klonoa is evidence that even if your work is made for a younger audience, it absolutely does not have to come at the cost of intelligence. The Klonoa duology still manages to tell a very personal, heartfelt story. One about how to deal with sadness, the dangers of growing too close to fictional works, and yet also at the same time how they still can inspire us. It says something when me, a man in his 20s can play these games and still feel very personally affected by them. These games are deconstructions of the platformer genre. Hell, the King of Sorrow even feels like a kind of deconstruction of the edgy kind of Shadow the Hedgehog type character. Even though, funny enough, Klonoa 2 came out three months before Sonic Adventure 2. Maybe I'm looking too deep into it. Oh well. What I do know is that Klonoa 2 did it first and better. Point is, these games are phenomenal and life-changing, and there really isn't anything I can think of that comes close to it. But wait. We're not done yet, are we? We know how the first game ends, and we know where Klonoa has to go now. And Lolo is in complete shambles. She cries, hugging him. But it's okay, because as long as she remembers her sadness, they'll at least always be together. The memories we have and share make us who we are. And sometimes the heartbreaking ones keep us connected to people. Other times they keep us moving forward. And Klonoa gives her one last thank you. Thanks for helping him get over the events from that first game. And seeing the value in life, in friendship, in living. All Klonoa knows is that wherever he goes next, he'll keep fighting. He'll have to leave his friends behind, but he'll make new ones, ones that he'll cherish forever. The fact he made them in the first place is worth it enough. As he walks away, we see water beneath his feet. He's no longer running away from leaving, now he's ready. It's no coincidence that after the credits scene, we get our name at the end. But instead of a storybook, now it's Klonoa's ring, telling us good morning. We don't quite know where Klonoa heads to next, but wherever it is, all we'll know is that he'll carry on. After all, we've come this far, right? Now let's discuss how they fucked it up. So even though I love Klonoa, it's kind of sold like shit. Klonoa 1 wasn't terrible, I guess, for 1997. I couldn't find any hard data, but it was revealed to me in a dream, so like, it made enough for there to be a Klonoa 2, which then Klonoa 2 would tank. Terribly. Namco then kind of pumped out a couple more games into 2002. And by games, I mean GBA spinoffs that probably aren't canon. There was a beach volleyball game released everywhere on the PS1 except for the West, my country. For some reason, Klonoa's British in it. I don't know why. But honestly, it might be my new headcanon. Here we go. Get, get it. Welcome to the 
took it out. Fuck, he didn't even move yet. Cause I leave. He just kicked off. Then they just kind of killed him off for six years. But thankfully, in 2008, they made a Wii remake of the first game. Yeah! What the fuck? Fuck is this? Why did they redesign him like a Final Fantasy 13 character? What the hell? Oh my god, no way. He looks like a Sonic character you draw porn of. He's supposed to be nine years old in the first game. Can we stop making Klonoa look like a fucking Sonic character, please? The one under the fucking Sonic. Sonic. Sonic sucks fucking bollocks. It's awful. It's fucking trash. Oh, and the worst part is his voice. His fucking <laughs> voice. So in the other games, they got Japanese voice actors to speak basically gibberish. But in the Wii remake, there is now an English dub. There is also a Japanese Phantom Million track too. But the dub literally changes the lines in Phantom Million as well. So it's not the same script as the original game. Plus, why would you want to ignore Klonoa's amazing new voice? The bad news, you barely get to hear it because he barely talks anymore in the game. But that means the few moments he does talk, Talk, it's gotta be real special. But we'll see each other again soon, right? Hey, let's go and hang out in the field together. Too bad the voice actor sucks dick. You said that we'd always be together! Help! Help! I can't believe I'm saying this. I, I liked it when he was British. <laughs> Fucking oh yeah, by the way, um, it's all the characters that are redesigned now. Hupo now has no hands. I don't know why, but he has no hands. But it was important though to give Joke a stick figure limb. It was also important to rename him to Joker. Well done, Joker. Hey, they're gonna bully us anyways for it, so. Hupo's prince form looks completely disgusting. The villagers look like a fucking hate crime. Hupo is now spelled differently. That's very important narratively. The colors in all the levels are all washed out and disgusting. The certain effects are just straight up missing. The health bar is fucking lame now. I mean, I guess gameplay wide, it's not the worst thing ever. It's a shot by shot, but mostly easier version of the first game. But the game just loses a lot of personality. The fact that Klonoa was a nine year old boy kind of made the ending hit hard. It's weird seeing this Sonic aged character talk about playing in the field. Bro, you're a fucking like teen now. Go vape in the bathroom. Oh, also they gave Joka a monologue before he kills Grandpa. Oh yeah, you know what? I didn't like the original game either. Please keep ruining it. <laughs> now I'll take that pendant if you don't mind. If you're gonna play these games, avoid the Wii version like the plague. It is not good. And apparently Bandai Namco didn't think so either because they marketed it like garbage. Get ready for an exciting adventure as you help Klonoa save Phantom Island. Uh, boss, we're supposed to make people want to buy the game? <laughs> <laughs> Sell me this pen. And for a while, this was it. This was the last Klonoa game ever. And it doomed the series for over a decade. That's not to say there weren't Klonoa things, period, once in a blue moon. Even though there really weren't. There was a 2012 webcomic posted on a now failed service and canceled after two years. And thankfully, however, the comic has been preserved. I haven't really gotten into it myself, but the art is really good from what I've seen. There was a Klonoa movie in the works around 2017. But because Klonoa has the luck of Bioshock when it comes to getting anything off the ground. It was of course canned in 2019, and for a while, that was it. Until finally, at a Nintendo Direct, Bandai Namco finally announced a remaster of the first two games. And this brings us to the Fantasy Reverie series. It came out last year, meaning it's the first Klonoa thing since 08. Not only that, but it got amazing large fanfare too. This franchise is finally getting attention. Klonoa, like the character, kept fighting, and he's alive. He's here. Here. And while it isn't a new game, just the remastered older ones, this is a brand new way for modern gamers to get into the series. And if the collection does well enough, who knows where this will go from here? This is great! This is awesome until you actually have to play the collection! Okay, look, with all this said, you should buy the Fantasy Reverie series. And if you have no other way of playing these games, legally, this is a fine, I guess, way of playing them. And I won't shoot you over playing these over the originals. However, here are the problems. The Noah 1 is basically the Wii version of the game, but they swapped the models and voices out. It is closer to the PS1 version. I like the models more. I like the graphics more. They're a lot more brighter and colorful. The voices are insanely bit crushed though. <laughs> 
And again, certain effects are still missing from this version of the game. The biggest loss, though, is the FMV cutscenes. In both the Wii and Fantasy Reverie versions, you get these cheap in-game cutscenes that aren't able to emote nearly as well as the PS1 cutscenes can. Even certain in-game cutscenes in the original game just look better. When Klonoa's grandpa dies, you no longer get that mortified face of pure shock. Also, I hate these giant text boxes. They're really ugly. With this ever-present skip and fast-forward button? Weirder because the Wii version had speech bubbles. And then there's Klonoa 2. The game removes cell shading and is way too oversaturated. Characters always glow for some reason. This makes the shading just look all wrong in certain areas. The Sea of Tears level looks really cheap. The rain looks awful here. Certain facial animations don't work at all for some reason. The water footsteps as Klonoa leaves are gone too. Ugh, why? Now, please don't get me wrong here. I'm happy this collection exists. And it is in the end what got me interested in Klonoa. This video wouldn't exist without it. And if you have no other way of legally playing these games, yeah, get this version. In fact, buy it anyway. Support the series. But the problems here are glaring and also unpacked. And it's pretty insane that Bandai Namco didn't at least dump in a PS1 emulator into this disc. Just so the original is preserved at least. But hey, it's something. Klonoa's alive. And hopefully this time, he stays a little longer. The Klonoa games are great, shockingly so. They're beautifully personal, artistic works. The people making Klonoa didn't just want to make another generic story. They really cared about this. There's a reason Klonoa resonates with people. Because Klonoa's story is personal. We relate to it. The thing is, Klonoa 2 was a perfect send-off. Even though we'll miss him, the memory of him will always remain in us. That is what Klonoa taught us. Good things always come to an end. We'll always find new people, new friends, new games. We'll always have stories that resonate with us. And we'll use them to influence our real life, but never be consumed by them. We'll always keep fighting for something in the end. And even though Klonoa is fake and fictional, it's nice having friends like him around. Friends that real people pour their heart and soul into. Even though they're fictional, real people pour their heart, souls, and minds into programming them, designing them, etc. And the time we had with our friend Klonoa was incredible. Even though he isn't around too often, we'll still fight for something, with or without him. I mean, hell, we've already come this far, right? But I'll admit, I would like to see him just one more time. Oh yeah, Sonic Frontier sucks dick by the way. Fuck you in the lane you came with. Me and you ain't on the same shit. You ain't in my lane, bitch. Nah, all that shit in fifth. Rolly on my wrist. Ay, baby, you a son. I'm my only wish. I'm counting. Blue honeys. I'm too money. Ay, that my little bitch, you too lovely. Yeah, hanging up and calling me right back. Ay, baby, why you calling me like that? Yeah. It's fucking trash. It's garbage. It's rubbish. Just floor it, floor it, floor it. Oh, I'm just bouncing around this corner, flooring it. Oh, I've got a thousand points for that. Oh, I've skidded out of control. Oh, I've got two thousand points for that. F it's floor it, floor it. <laughs> I'm winning. Floor it. Oh, f off.